Have you ever been a mental patient? <laughs> Just don't believe that. Listen, I'm in the union. You're going to have to pay me. Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> TV. We're, we're doing a tape on mental patients' liberation, and we're trying to get attitudes to how you know people feel towards state hospitals, whether they've ever had any experience themselves with them and that sort of thing. Have you ever been in, in a hospital? Do you know anyone that has? Yeah, several times. You yourself have? How do you feel? Do you feel like you really received treatment there? Do you think it helped you? Not at all. Inside a so-called hospital, you simply don't have any rights anymore. I mean, you know, whatever, whatever there is on paper, and there are plenty of rights on paper, you know. There are plenty of rights on paper, but the rights in practice are practically non-existent. Because if you sign yourself into a mental hospital, you're finished. If you want to get a, me a message to the outside, you're going to have to have you know, your visitor do it. Nobody is allowing you to go to a phone and call your lawyer. To point out that there really is preventive detention in this country, and it must be eliminated through getting rid of the psychiatrist's power. Do you feel that this is a place where people can receive help, or do you feel that it really offers little help? Well, I think, I think the facilities are crowded, and so on and so forth, but in this particular case, the patient has received adequate help, in my opinion. How long have you known them, and how, how long ago were they in the institution? Currently in the institution. In the you know, part of the myth that the psychiatrists have, have gotten, gotten across to people, that they and their hospitals are places where you go when you're upset or flipped out and they have some kind of way of making you better and better able to cope with with your problems and i just think you find out when you go in that it's not true that what you're in is a a world that you have to learn how to cope with and it's a very difficult world to cope with but it's certainly you know not anything like what what caused your problems in the first place you feel that people should be subject to being committed involuntarily I don't believe in voluntarily. I think there has to be, uh, I think it has to be uh, for their own uh, feelings that they have to want to because uh, if there's no uh, real feel for it, I don't doubt if it can really help them. If they really want to be helped, they can be. Rockland is in Rockland County, Jersey, right? No, New York. Yeah. 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 Not for me, because I got to pick everything on my lap. Suspended by the same people that did the centralized Sure. <laughs> brought to you by the same people who brought you. Oh. Look at those well, goddamn porches. Oh, oh God, do I remember that? Yeah, that really just grabbed me. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to remember. Describe the architecture of this place. I can't. It's a I don't even remember going to Bellevue, you know, first going to Bellevue, but I, you know, I remember here. You know, they never really told me where I was going. I just assumed it was going to be just like Bellevue, you know, because I knew that when September came, I didn't go back to school. And, uh, you know, I figured they were going to lock me up again. So I got here and they put me in this room with all these kids and I freaked. Ted, can you tell us how you felt when you were brought here as a child? I can't. Huh? I can't. 
Can you understand what I mean? If I stop talking, then I'll just get very upset and I'll start crying. I really don't want to do that on camera. I'm sorry, but I can't do it. It's like all I can do to keep myself together enough to talk rationally right now. So to say that what we want to do is take away the power of psychiatrists, you know, the power that they have to lock people up without any trial, without any kind of accusation, without any protection of their rights. I mean, what the American public has done is give the psychiatric profession unlimited power to lock up a certain class of people. Anyone who's accused of, the, of being mentally ill has absolutely no rights at all. The American public goes along with this because the psychiatric profession has the kind of image that people feel this power isn't being misused. And we're here today to see that some of this image is rubbed off and people see psychiatrists for what they really are. Uh, supposedly they swore to me that they did not give shock treatment. A week after I left, they started doing uh, two, two people, giving two people shock treatment. And I think you really have a responsibility to say whether you agree with us or not. Do you think what we say in our leaflet is true? Because your first response to it was to ask us, well, how would we change things? You're running the places, how would you change things? And are you conceding that what we say in our leaflet is true? And if not, let's hear what you do have to say. I'd like to especially hear from Dr. Good since he runs a state hospital. Well, he doesn't run one, but he helps run one. Um, of course, uh, you are wrong in that uh, there is in existence a, a utilization review committee which uh, checks upon the uh, performance of physicians and their treatment plans in existence in every state hospital. There is an arm of the court in every state hospital known as the Mental Health Information Service. Pretend that they don't know what's going on because they can point to all these laws on the books. These laws on the books do not get down to the people in the wards. People are not, do not hear about the Mental Health Information Service. A lot of people in our group never heard of the Mental Health Information Service the whole time they were in the hospital. The first time they heard about it was, it was mentioned in the group. What's the Mental Health Information Service? They're supposed to notify every single patient of their rights. Uh, the only, I, I, you never heard of them at all, did you, Barbara? No, not no. until I joined this group. No, but I, I, I was given a leaflet by the, from the Mental Health Information Service, but I think the first or second day I was in Rockland. It came immediately after I was stripped and skin searched. It had a little different effect that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, fir the first day I was in Rockland, I was, you know, very upset at finding myself there. I certainly didn't want to be there. And I uh, sat down on this chair in the day room, and I was, uh, really feeling pretty low, and I uh, kind of put my knees up like this, and put my head down on my knees, and I sat that way for a few minutes, and uh, one of the patients came up to me and said, don't sit like that, and I said, why not? And she looks at me and she said, they'll think you're depressed. Do you think that state mental institutions are places where people can be helped when they're having problems? Definitely. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. Are you aware that people can be committed? Anyone is eligible for commitment to an institution on the word of two psychiatrists and a complainant? And a, any complainant, not, a, not necessarily a relative? No, I didn't know that. Do you feel if a psychiatrist says you're nuts, you better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can be committed to a hospital upon the word of two psychiatrists and a complainant? Right, I know that. Do you think that's a good idea? No. Because well, the uh, complainants sometimes could want to get rid of the person, and I really don't think so. Any two of the three of you, by simply signing a form, could lock up any one of the four of us for the rest of our lives in a mental institution. And I'm sure at this point you would love to do it if you thought you could get away with it. The fact is you do have the power to do that. That's precisely the power you have. That's the power that you have, Dr. Good. That's the power that you use every single day at Central Islip. It is not. You deny that you have the power to lock us up? I certainly have the power with a colleague to lock somebody up, providing there's a petitioner. Uh, and providing there is a, a psychiatric reason for such a move. What, what did it mean getting out at the age of 17, having been in there practically all your life that you would remember? Well, I was very lonely, you know, because I really didn't know how to talk to people. I remember very vividly the 
second job that I had, there was a young girl there who was a secretary, and I was a mm -hmm. shipping clerk and messenger boy, and she was being very friendly with me, and uh, even then I kind of recognized and that she wanted me to pay some attention to her. But I didn't know what on earth to say to her. I mean, what could I say to her? You know, surely, you know, you graduated from Midwood High School, and I just graduated from Rockland School. The mental, the mental Health Information Service tours the wards every week. Uh, they I, the wards at Rockland. I'm sorry if they didn't tour the wards at Rockland, about which I know nothing, but I do know how often they tour the wards where I am. And furthermore, if it is so farcical, the appearance in court of uh, a patient, how is it that uh, patients are periodically uh, allowed to be released there and then in the courtroom and pilgrim. What's the percentage? The percentage may be low. What percentage? Sure is. How low? Can you give us the percentage? I, I don't know it. What do you have with Bellevue? Oh, a friend of mine uh, had a bummer on an acid trip, and uh, he, was, he committed himself <coughs> prematurely, and they wouldn't let him out. And uh, he was okay after he came down. And I went up to visit him, and it was really pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> How long was he there? Do you know? He was there about a week, a week, and uh, uh, he, they weren't going to let him leave right away. But he finally got his clothes together and just walked out. And I, they never came after him. I guess they figure if you're intelligent enough to, to find a way out, they'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I would like to ask of you, no matter how bad your experiences were in the various hospitals you were in, and no matter how sadistic perhaps your psychiatrist, no matter how much they kept you incommunicado, all four of you are here and you're loose. Because you either just well, play the game. Why did you get oh, out there? Oh, I just learned to uh, yeah. tap dance and do uh, anything balance, old Dr. Right? Prasad <laughs> wanted me to do. Uh, I think <laughs> maybe, what he's, maybe what he's saying is he's sorry we got out. The main characteristic of most forms of mental illness is lack of insight. Therefore, the patient is the worst judge of what is best for him or her, or whether they should have shock treatment or Thorazine or whatever. Say should be done to improve the services in this hospital or is this the only state hospital you've been in? Yes, yeah, what would the state what hospital should be done to improve it? Well, I haven't given past thought to it, and on the spur of the moment, uh, I, uh, I couldn't make a, a comment at this point without uh, further uh, thinking on it. It's, if you had given me a few minutes to prepare it, perhaps I could come up with more intelligent comments. But I do know that uh, the sincerity of the staff to improve and their continual drive in this direction, I think then that this will alone offset any suggestions or ideas that I might have. Uh, first of all, you know, you didn't answer our question because you still haven't said whether the accusations we make about what happens in the state hospitals are true. And second of all, don't say you don't run the state hospital. You're assistant director of Central ISIP. Are you telling us that all these things happen by themselves, that no one is responsible for them, or are you saying that they don't happen? If you're saying they don't happen, say that they don't happen so that we can answer them. Or if you're conceding that they do happen, then what are you conceding? Well, uh, what I'm conceding. Are there concentration camps? Are there concentration camps that even, you're the, even though you're the assistant director of one, you can't do anything about these conditions? They are not concentration camps. Uh, they are institutions which have a long historical heritage and are undergoing an agonizing reappraisal which has been what accelerating in intensity since about 1956 and there isn't the slightest doubt that they are changing totally in character. No one uh, in their right mind would claim that they are perfect, uh, but they are improving. What do you think could be done to improve the services here as you've experienced them? Well, to my experience, 
and we are up here being the we are alcoholics and we we don't destroy anything i figured that we we should have the privilege of having our own telephone so we can make calls at any time that we want to because there's a lot of the people the girls here that have children and they would like to you know get in touch with their kids and talk to their children well if they want to do that now what's the procedure we have to get permission from a doctor to go down and make a telephone call, one call a week. And I think that's ridiculous. Good morning, ma'am. Have you ever been in a mental hospital? Do you know anyone that has? No, I haven't. I have many friends who have been, yes. Do you, pleasant places. Do you think that mental hospitals are places where people can be helped when they're in trouble? No, no. But I'm, my psychological influences are people like Ronald Lang, so yeah. I, I think that's what you're going to find in the village, really. I think the um, society like ours is composed of institutions, and that's just one more example of what we do with people that we don't know what to do with because they don't fit into the common social pattern. The days are so unbelievably long because there's, you know, they're so boring and there's so little to do, and the, the filling up the hours becomes like the major preoccupation. I mean, if you take somebody who's like, you know, really coping with the world beautifully and put him in this situation, uh, you know, it would be pretty hard for him to, you know, keep himself together because, the, you know, they really do their best to, to try to mess up your head. I mean, they get you up at some ridiculous hour like 5.30 and, you know, when they come and, and yell to get up, you know, you, you get up then. You don't get up, you know, you don't stay in bed another five minutes. And you get up and you get dressed and washed and all that business. It doesn't take, you know, all that long. And by that time, maybe it's 6 or a little after and breakfast is something like 7.30. So they herd you all into the day room and it's a question of like, you know, past the time. I mean, there's nothing to do in the day room. There's maybe a couple of books. There's the radio, TV, uh, you know, people to talk to, if, you know, if you feel like talking to somebody. And, you know, it's a couple of hours of that, and then it's breakfast. Well, that's a big break. You know, man, I made it all the way to breakfast. I mean, these, these hours are just, just, just incredibly long. The t Twenty years ago, uh, the patients in a state institution would ask you almost unanimously to leave. Now, a good 50% of uh, people are asking you, please don't discharge me. I am not ready to go. And furthermore, what brings into a state institution. It is their aberrant behavior. And uh, in there it's worse because um, the first sign that you might be getting well, a symptom might be coming out, you know, shoot you with Thorazine, you know, Thorazine drag, man. That's a very real thing. From my point of view, if a patient refuses medication, uh, sometimes there may be some justification for it, and we evaluate the patient's uh, feelings about it, and uh, sometimes we try him out on uh, modified dosage of medication or on no medication at all to see how the patient gets along. However, usually those patients who refuse medication are the ones that are probably who need it most. Now you're speaking of uh, it possibly being appropriate that the patient take this medication. Who has more right to decide that than a person himself? The first I mean, who has more right to decide what he's going to do with his own body than the patient himself? Within the first couple of hours that I was in Rockland, I was uh, given a little plastic cup. And I asked what it was, and they said, it's your medicine, take it. And uh, when you get something in a little plastic cup, you don't know to brace yourself, you drink it like it's orange juice or something like that. I think there must have been about six or eight attendants gathered around in a little circle. And I was in the middle of the circle with a little plastic cup. <laughs> and uh, about five minutes later when I got my breath back, because this stuff, it just tastes, it, it's, it, it feels like, like everything is being burned away. The lips, the tongue, the throat, all the way down. You stand there like this. And there was this little semicircle of attendance, and they were kind of, you know, it was a nice show. I got electroshock treatment when I was six years old. 
This was prescribed by Dr. Loretta Bender, who I understand still has a large reputation in the field of child psychiatry. At that time, nobody knew what electroshock treatments did. They there was a new treatment, know. I know that. And I know when people still don't know what electroshock treatments do. And if any of you want to deny that, I can start citing the literature to you because I once did a paper on it. And for every, for every research study that says one thing, there's three research studies that, says, that say something else. And no one knows if there's permanent brain damage. No one knows if there's, you know, a reduction in IQ. No one knows anything. All they know is it's a, you know, it's something that can be labeled well, what treatment. What are the medical indications for giving shock treatment to a six-year-old child? May I speak to that point? I was at Bellevue at the time when Dr. Loretta Bender gave those shock treatments to you. Help these people. Now, Dr. Paul Schilder, who was an international psychiatrist, and Dr. Loretta Bender got together on this thing, and they tried whether or not it was successful was another matter, but they had to do something for these people. Yeah, and it was not a question of guinea pigs or anything like that. They were both dedicated psychiatrists who did... They weren't the guinea pigs. He yeah. was the guinea ...who did pig. whatever they he could. The guinea pig like that. And perhaps since you are here now, perhaps it was helpful to you. I don't know. Well, before I say something more rational, I wonder if you were one of the people who was turning the switch on for me, Dr. Levine. But do you do feel that, that people should be incarcerated? Well, isn't it for their protection as well as the public's protection? The fact of the matter was that I was committed to Bellevue because I was a very shy child who didn't mix with other children, who stayed by himself in the corner, in the corner of a room, right, and I read a lot. I had an IQ of 180, and as you may or may not know, very gifted children often have trouble relating to, you know, children of average intelligence. However, what the label I was given was childhood schizophrenia, and you know very well that the, what I'm talking about would not have made me a childhood schizophrenic. There was only one reason I was given that label. I was given that label so that I could be a guinea pig, so that people like you could say what you just said, that this is a hopeless case, and there's no other kind of treatment available. So we're going to try this. We're going to try this. Isn't that what people were saying at the same time in some other country at that time, in 1944? They were going to try ground glass in people's uteruses. They were going to try subjecting people to intolerable pain to see what happened. I don't think what was done to me was any different from the Nazi concentration camp experiments. And it was right. done to me, it was done to me because I was under the power of your profession. They were able to give me a label that defined me as not a human being and made it possible for them to do anything to me they wanted. Do you think that state mental hospitals are places where people can get help? Well, I think, of course, yes. I do. They must have help somewhere if they're not financially uh, able to pay for private places. Uh, they have to go to the state hospital. Any faces? Yeah. Yeah, watch your face. Okay. Where are you from now? I'm from Global Village. Global Village? Where's that? So we have to get people who have been through this to stop feeling ashamed of their experience, to stop putting themselves down, to stop, you know, following, right, for them to come out of the closet, for them to openly declare themselves as ex-mental patients, for them, to, for them to get organized and start fighting back. I think one of the main reasons why, you know, nothing's ever been, why very little has changed in, in the, in the uh, mental hospital industry, you know, in, in 100 years is that the people who have been its victims have not fought back. And a large part, you know, of your stay in the hospital is designed to put you in such a shape that when you do get out, you know, you're in no shape to fight back. So I think our first step to get anything done is that, is that you know, is that people who are ex-patients have to get themselves together, right? And I'd like to, you know, look into the camera and say to the people who are watching this program, of which 10% statistically will be ex-mental patients, that don't kid yourself, don't say it doesn't really bother you now. Don't say it doesn't have any effect on you now. Don't say that there's nothing that can be done anyway, because you're just dooming yourself if you do that. You know you're still going to have to face answering the question, have you ever been in a mental hospital when you get a job? You know that every your time you make a... Your right, your fingerprints are on record. You know that every time you, you, you make a new friend, 
and every start time you start a relationship with somebody, you're always wondering, what will they think of me if they know I'm an ex-mental patient? Don't kid yourself. It's part of your identity, and you might as well start fighting and doing something about it what? and join our movement. Right. Have you ever been a mental patient, or do you know anyone that has? No, I think that all people are mental patients because you're under God. And by the way, don't ever get a visual picture of things. You've got to live through it in order to learn. Because you're so young, then you'll learn how to do things. Okay, well, thank you. All right. I love you and stay well. No, no, no. Laugh. Now, beautiful people. Because without you in a nice way, what else can we do? But have respect for mother and father and God always. That's number one. Okay, thank you.